All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our uh, fourth in the series uh, as we go through this. Um, as you can see, we're going to deal with part four. So this is our respond uh, piece. So thanks for joining us. Uh, I am Chris Haig. I'm with Mercury IT, and I am their Chief Information Security Officer. So basically, I look after the security aspects for our clients and for Mercury IT themselves. Now, Mercury IT are predominantly an IT services uh, provider. So that's the bulk of what we do, but it goes around cybersecurity, uh, consulting services, whether it's migrations into the cloud, et cetera. If you need help with any of that or to discuss it, then please uh, get in contact. Now, in this series, uh, we've been dealing with the NIST cybersecurity framework. Now, if you've not joined us before and this is your first time on here, just kind of catching up, uh, we do have the pre-recorded videos as well, so you can go back and have a look at those. But the reason why we chose the NIST cybersecurity framework specifically was it's relatively easy to understand. So the whole idea or concept around the framework was it was supposed to be written in plain English so that it could be uh, implemented very easily across uh, your business. Now, it's split into uh, five functions. As we can see there, we've got identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Now, under each of those sections, there are categories and subcategories. So we don't have that much time to dig into any of the kind of subcategories. So we kind of stick to the uh, category pieces across the top. And then we'll dig a little bit deeper into certain areas where we see uh, that, you know, try and give you a little bit more to go away and actually start putting these sort of plans together so that you do actually have a framework that you can implement. Now, in total with the subcategories, and I do uh, advise you to go and look up the framework yourself just to see if there's other areas that you might need to uh, pay attention to and put in place, because there's 108 categories in total, um, or subcategories, should I say, under each of these sections. So like I said, so today we're dealing with the respond section, so the fourth uh, function. Now, under the respond, we've got response planning. So we'll take a look at each of these in more detail, but we've got communications, analysis, mitigation, and then improvements. Now, just a note on the notifiable data breaches uh, report uh, that recently uh, came out, and it's just interesting from a, a statistics point of view. So I thought I'd just uh, throw this slide up there. And you could see there's talking about uh, criminal attacks still being the highest percentage at 61%, and then human error at 34%. The only thing I would note on that, it's interesting because under the malicious or criminal attacks is also uh, phishing. Now, for me, a lot of the times when we talk about social engineering and phishing, that to me is pretty much a human error as well, because it's a case of we haven't actually uh, trained our people properly, so it's a mistake, it's an error. Um, so I wouldn't really put that as a malicious or criminal attack. So it's, it's kind of interesting where it fits. But if you take a look at some other stats, they talk about 90% of all successful breaches generally would start with something like a phishing attack. So something, something to think about. Now, when we look at response planning, we talk uh, about uh, how that response plan is executed. So it's around the processes and the policies and so forth. Now, we, we're going to dig a lot more into this uh, because we've got uh, Martin O'Riordan with us today, and I'll introduce him in a second. But we'll actually dig a little bit deeper into these uh, plans and what that actually needs to look like uh, for your business. Now, they talk about... Um, the response plan itself. Now, we're going to go through um, the stuff like what the authority lines need to look like and the areas that you need to uh, think about. And a lot of people do ask, okay, well, is, is it possible to outsource that development of the response plan? And yes, of course you can. But what I would say is you can't kind of handball it off. It, it doesn't quite work like that. Uh, at the end of the day, your business and you are responsible for any kind of breach and how you actually respond and how you notify. So you can't just hand that over specifically. What you do need to do is look for a partner that's experienced in writing these plans up and actually works with you and develops a response plan that works for your business and then maybe works with you to deal with the notification areas as well. 
Now, we're going to go through a lot of these details today. So you should be able to take a lot of what we go through today and actually build out your own uh, response plan. But just bear in mind that there might be gaps in uh, the knowledge of uh, your team, um, for instance, on how to actually do maybe the forensics part of that or how do I go through logs. So there might be technical uh, areas that you may need uh, extra help with. Now, communication is incredibly important. So, I mean, we've, we've spoken about it a lot of times, and I think every business is the same. You know, when we start to have uh, issues, we, we come back to communication. So we do talk about uh, roles being defined, and we're talking about, and we'll go through those roles, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as well, how those incidents are reported, um, how the information is shared, both internally and externally. So an example, for instance, of um, information sharing is you may need to contact law enforcement, as an example, um, and share that information with them as well. Analysis, uh, this is the part that I was talking about with the uh, forensics and uh, so forth. So actually understanding what the impact is so that uh, we can categorize those incidents. Are they actually important or not? Has harm actually come to someone or not? Or is it possible? So those processes and how that's actually dealt with does need to be defined within the plan. Mitigation is uh, quite important. There's three elements here that we talk about. Uh, firstly is containment, uh, absolutely critical. If there is a data breach, the very, very first thing we need to do is actually contain that data breach. So we need to stop it as soon as possible. So if a, a criminal has got into your uh, network via an open IDP connection, which is quite topical at the moment, um, and is now starting to exfiltrate data, the first thing you need to do is find out like where is it being exfiltrated for from getting in there, kicking them off the server and like for instance uh, locking that port down so no one else can get onto the uh, system in the meantime. So there's those sort of containment uh, pieces. Mitigation would be things like putting something in place that can't actually happen again uh, or at least reducing the risk is going to be important. Uh, Got there as well, new vulnerabilities are mitigated or documented. So that's gonna be a case of actually doing continual vulnerability assessments. And this actually came up in the earlier sections as well. Now, talking about uh, reporting a data breach, I'll come back onto that in a second, but it, it, it is talking about the uh, Office of the Information uh, Commissioner and talking about the um, when you actually need to uh, report that breach. But we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And finally, we've got improvements. Now, improvements are, are the standard kind of stuff like lessons learned. It's very much like running any project. So if we're going through an incident, we need to work out if there are better ways of dealing with things. So I'd like to introduce uh, Martin Ariden. So uh, also with Mercury IT, our general manager and head of uh, cybersecurity. So I want to speak to uh, Martin a bit. Martin, how are you going? Good, thanks. Good morning. Thanks hey. for having me. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about uh, what you are responsible for at Mercury. So I'm responsible for heading up our cybersecurity department, which is specifically around uh, both internal and external cybersecurity matters. So it is uh, a lot of the governance, compliance, uh, and heading up that uh, uh, component of the business where we start to look at how we, we reduce our cybersecurity risks and how we advise our customers on on how they can reduce their cybersecurity risk going forward. So, a lot of it is that that very high level, uh, you know, policy based uh, responses to cybersecurity. Yeah, I mean, boring, but yes. uh, <laughs> definitely needed, right? <laughs> yeah, it's not as fun as the technical components that you get involved in, but uh, it certainly <laughs> is uh, uh, interesting in in itself. So. Uh, Aspects such as the notifiable data breach legislation, uh, the the Privacy Act, uh, dealing with, uh, you know, hack. What what does a hack mean? What what does it mean to hack into a system? What are the legislative requirements around that? How do we, how do we deal with that from a a customer base? And being able to do it in a practical manner because uh, a lot of customers uh, are small to medium enterprises, so they may not have the the same resources as, you know, an ASX listed company. No, absolutely, absolutely. And um, I, I said earlier, I was going to say uh, for our audience, what I want to do is I actually want to talk a little bit more about the plan because it's quite important. Like pretty much uh, any business 
that's running actually requires a, a response plan um, as per the legislation. And there's a lot of businesses that actually don't even realize that they require a plan. In fact, it, in the legislation, it's one of those little elements that come out that going that says you need a documented uh, plan. Uh, for incident reporting. So let's let's dig into that a little bit. And okay. the, the very, very first thing that came up was talking about defining roles and responsibilities. Now, in your experience, like we've we've written up quite a few of these plans for uh, for our customers in the past. What are the areas that they need to need to think about? So that there are a number of areas, and yet you, you're right. We've done a lot of these uh, across uh, the couple of years since the, the NDB came into play, and some of the areas that, that people need to think about are, you know, team coordination, uh, risk management, communication, legals. Uh, so I can go through them. So wh what it means is, especially in small to medium business, some of these roles or these responsibilities will essentially be the same person. So they may be, uh, you know, the, the owner of the business, for instance, or they may be the admin person, or you might have a couple of people that are responsible for a few of these different areas uh, across their business. Mm. Uh, likewise, in a large business, you might have someone who is, is specifically responsible for risk. So you might have a risk manager or you might have a uh, risk committee within the board, uh, for instance. So there are a, a lot of things that can go across both ways. So, so first and foremost, in a response team, you'll have a team coordinator. So uh, fairly obvious they are the person who takes the, the team and coordinates what's going on all of the activities right. of the response team uh, you'll have generally you'll have an executive member and so that can be as i said it could be the owner of the business it could be a managing director a ceo general manager someone who's senior in the the organization who can be uh, involved in the response team because they might have to make decisions on the fly as you, you're actually doing oh, the investigation. I was going to say, is it because of the, that decision-making piece that needs to happen there? It, and it just shortens those those responses. So if you have to keep going back to someone else uh, who's not on the team, it, it can just delay your responses. And one of the things about a, a detected breach, or if you've got a breach, is response, speed mm. of response, and being able to, as you, you mentioned earlier, is that that uh, you know mitigation of what's occurring and, and how fast you mitigate it really does make a big difference to uh, the the view external view of how you've handled that incident. No, absolutely. So then, then you have obviously risk management. So risk management is an interesting one because, as I said, in, in a large organisation, enterprise type spaces, you'll have a risk manager. Quite often, you'll have a, a risk um, subcommittee of the board because it's so right. important. So that they will have a responsibility for how they manage risk in the organization. In a smaller organization, obviously it, that, that may be the same person as that executive role. They, they may be right. the same person. Uh, then we go on, to, another responsibility is communication. Now, what we're talking about communication here is, is a lot of it is public relations, media and communication, communicating outside the organization. This is really important because one of the things that quite a lot of organizations don't do right is that public relation piece when mm. they've had a breach. You, you see so often where, where organizations have tried to hide it, uh, tried to just sweep it on the carpet and hope for the best. Unfortunately, well. no, unfortunately <laughs> quite often it comes out or it'll come out in a couple of years time when you've got a disaffected staff member who was part of the, the team that identified it. They've still stayed in the business for a couple of years when they've left for some other reason. They then go and tell everyone about the, that breach that happened two years ago. We've, we've seen a few of those where company X has had a breach, you know, 12 months ago and it only comes out today. Yeah. And that the company knew about it, that they had uh, internally, they knew all about the, the issue, but they just didn't bother telling anyone. And, and that can be a bit of a PR nightmare. So generally speaking, PR around a breach is best when it's done up front. But obviously it's got to be a measured response based on the severity of the incident uh, and whether there's harm actually occurred from that incident. So quite often most organizations might rely on a public relations and external public relations person to help with this. And right. certainly th their expertise could be invaluable in that space. But being on the front foot definitely makes a difference and making sure you use the right language because obviously if you you use the wrong language in those sorts of situations, you can make your PR uh, situation worse, not better. Sure. Uh, and that PR piece, that, that 
why we talk about it here in the responsibility matrix is because a most organizations will have very strict guidelines on who can talk to the media from an organizational perspective because it's it's such a a component that can have such a big impact on the business going forward so it that really has to be a key one that you've got you've defined up front so you don't have a situation where you you're scrambling trying to look for someone who can talk to a media if they're, they're responding um, then you've got legal and regulation now look legal and regulation is is kind of what you said earlier it's the kind of the boring part and sometimes you'll have someone internally who might have some knowledge around that i mean that's that's part of my role is, is is that legal and regulation component for our business and for our customers when we we talk about these these scenarios is uh, that that knowledge doesn't come quickly or easily so sometimes in a small business that might be a you know your, your company solicitor you might actually engage them and say hey uh, we're putting our plan together if we have an incident um, would you be prepared to be part of that that team? And and you can have that conversation with the solicitor up front, it's including around the fees. How much would they charge for that that particular mm-hmm. service? And and have someone who has a uh, uh, some experience around it, or even if it's just that they can advise you on on where to go for some of those legal aspects. Right. Uh, then you have personnel HR. Uh, that's pretty pretty obvious. It's around the staff requirements, as you mentioned before. Most uh, breaches occur by some kind of a, either a staff mistake or a staff member doing something that they shouldn't have been doing. So clicking on something that they they probably shouldn't have. So in those instances where you start engaging personnel into a uh, the response team is because you may have some uh, disciplinary matters to deal with with a staff member and whether that's a uh, all the way from counselling because they might be uh, also feeling the effects of, of the mistake they've made if they've made a mistake all the way through to if someone has breached one of your policies and has done something that they really shouldn't have uh, even to the the extent that it could be someone who has maliciously uh, applied something internally so you do have instances it is unfortunately still a major vector for attack is insider threats so yeah of course so those aspects come into that HR component. Okay. Um, then you have the records, you know, it's just expertise around the organization's records. And where this is important is you, you need to understand your data. I think in one of the earlier um, parts of the NIST framework, you would have talked about uh, that that data knowledge, understanding what data you have around uh, personal information, yep. where it's stored, how <laughs> it's stored, what, who has access to it, because if you're doing the analysis of a breach, you need to know what data has actually been accessed. And if you, you have no idea around what data has been accessed, it's very difficult to analyze where the harm's been done in that, that breach. Yeah. Um, now we come to a really important one. Well, we, we think so because we're in IT. So the IT team, and this is the, the responsibility where as a managed service provider like we are, we, we fulfill that that space for uh, our customers. And this is the team that is responsible first and foremost for containing the breach, you know, assessing the cause, the effects and the scope. Uh, and they implement the short and long-term remediation, as you mentioned about the remediation part. So IT, the IT team needs to be a uh, across the, the entire plan. They need to be uh, capable of, of actually responding in, in this instance. And if you've got an internal team, they need to be part of that as well. So uh, also, if you have an internal team, you might have an internal team of one, for instance, you might have a, a business where you have one IT person on staff. Mm-hmm. You might need to have then someone you can outsource to help you with a breach. So you might, when you're doing the response planning, you would actually start to assess whether or not uh, you have all the capabilities in-house to deal with a breach or whether or not you would have you know, spoken to someone uh, you know, like us uh, mm-hmm. or other, other many service providers that could provide that, uh, you know, those capabilities and skills if the, the, the case comes up. Right. And they can extend on your team then because if you've got one or two people internally and you're expecting them to do all of these uh, components containing breaches, assessing things, they might be quite overloaded or it might be outside of their skill set. So mm-hmm. that, that's a part that you'd be wanting to plan up front is how that works. 
And then of course you've got the strategy piece, which is around uh, you know the staff member or staff members who are responsible for assessing the strategic impact. Again, quite often as when we've done these plans, almost all of them, the strategy piece and the executive role are, are pretty much aligned. So mm. most of them have actually been the same person. Yep, that makes sense. And there's quite a, quite a few uh, responsibilities there. So I'll, I'll cover them off again, if I can remember them. So uh, we started with a team coordinator, uh, we had that executive uh, piece, which was generally strategy as well. Uh, there was a uh, risk, so that could be a risk officer. Um, it, we had someone responsible for communications, but that was kind of heavily focused on the PR side, so it could be external. Uh, we had legal, uh, again, could be internal, might be an external uh, party. Uh, HR. Uh, to deal with that, uh, records keeping and IT. So we've got to have all of those. Uh, and again, could totally be one person. It, it could be, and, and we've seen that. We, we have seen that. Or it's m mostly one, some of the ones we've seen is it's it's all one person except for the IT function, which is generally us. So right. okay. So it, it, it can <clears throat> be the case of that, or you, they'll split it up. You might have an admin manager who's responsible for records, HR, uh, those are elements and you might have an executive or a, a general manager, et cetera, who's responsible for risk, communications, legal. So th enough. that's kind of where the split seems to happen quite often. Alrighty, so going back to the plan then. So the first part of the plan was to make sure we've got our team in place. So we've spoken about the responsibilities that that team covers. So the very, very next thing that we're gonna need to have in place is how that team actually gets notified for instance, uh, internally or externally, and what happens from there. So for instance, if a common mistake, a staff member sends an email to the wrong person, right? Uh, external to your company, and it's got personal identifiable information in, of another client, as an example, and that goes out. Yeah. What actually happens? So your plan has to have information and and, this plan has to be shared with staff. Staff need to know what to do when a mistake like that happens. Or, and we've had this before as well, where a, a person actually gets an email from an external party informing them of a breach, as in, I have seen X, Y, Z, or I've noticed I've, I'm getting email from one of your staff members that looks like it's breached. So again, they need to know how to actually communicate. So in your plan, when you're putting your plan together, so you've got your team, you've got to have that flow chart of that communication of what initially happens when you get informed of a breach or sus uh, su uh, suspected breach internally or externally. The very yeah. next steps go into uh, what do you do from there? So there's uh, steps. Now, the Information Commissioner does have an outline and it's just a four step process, Martin. Do you want to take us through that? Yeah, so it, it, it's fairly simple. It's, it's step one is contain the breach and do preliminary assessment. The step two yep. is evaluating the risks associated with the breach. Uh, step three is notification and step four is prevent future breaches. So it, it is simple a, a full enough. It, very simple, very simple. In when you say it quickly, uh, actually, <laughs> actually doing it is another scenario because containing the breach and doing the preliminary assessment, that that in itself can be complex uh, yep. in, in certainly finding what has actually occurred. Uh, it could be as simple as that email uh, mistake where someone has emailed something incorrectly, uh, or it could be something that has has been occurring for some time. And, and as we know, quite often uh, where identified breaches have made it into the media or into reporting um, statistics is that quite often the malicious actors have been in the system for a long time and the time between when when they've actually accessed the system to when it, it's known that they're accessed is in excess of 60 days so it, it's a, a scenario where going back that far can be a little bit difficult and one of the things that we, we have found quite often in that space is is not having sufficient uh, logs to actually be able to investigate. So uh, generally, a lot of a um, lot of uh, information is only stored for you know 30 days, maybe less, depending on how much storage space um, you might have. So if if a an event has actually predated that, it can be very difficult to do that investigation. Absolutely. 
Okay. I mean, what sort of like, if, if we're doing an investigation, what sort of things, uh, again, just trying to make sure our audience have got, uh, have got this covered, what sort of information uh, about the breach would we have to know about? So if we go in as their IT team, what are some of the elements that we're going to need to know about this breach? So we, we're going to need to know time and dates. We're going to need to know uh, what actually, like the location of the breach, the duration, uh, what sort of information uh, has been involved in the breach. And specifically, we're looking for a lot of things like either company information, personal information, things that are going to help us assess whether that harm has been uh, has occurred, uh, how the breach was discovered and whom. So we, we need to keep some good records around mm. this process as well. Uh, the cause and extent, the list of the affected individuals. So if, for instance, a, uh, a, a database list has actually been part of the breach, that could have some significant um, impacts on on how we, how we assess that harm because there, there could be a lot of information. Um, and the risk of serious harm to affected individuals. So th there's a lot of information to be captured. One of the things that we do recommend when, when we do these um, uh, set up a, a response team is having uh, a central email box that has legal hold on it. So something that, that has uh, the ability to be stored and looked at later so that you can send all of your information to an internal email address. And so wow. you've got, You've, you've not only got timestamps on when things have been discovered, but you've got the ability that that information is stay is is uh, able to stay in that 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 email box, and uh, it has legal hold, so someone can't just accidentally delete it or, or remove it okay. at a, a future point. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. So, what about notifications then? Now, step three. What's um, what are some of the areas that we have to think about there? Well, one of the, the things about notification is is under the, the notifiable data breach um, legislation, you have to notify where there has been harm, significant harm done to individuals. Okay, and so what do, we, what do we mean by that then? Okay, what's, so what's what, the harm what that? So what we're talking about is something that has the, the, the potential to cause uh, uh, psychological harm, financial harm. Uh, it could be uh, reputational harm. There's a lot of things that, that right. could, so it could be, uh, information such as medical records, or it could be, uh, you know, date of birth, credit card numbers. It could be credit information. These things have the the potential to cause significant harm. Mm. Also, what comes into play when we're considering that is is how many people have been affected. If we're talking one individual has been affected, we we can mitigate that rather quickly because it's one person. We could talk to that one person. We can actually advise them where where to go. If we're talking a list of 40,000 individuals, it becomes significantly more difficult to, to mitigate that harm. And, th and that's where, when we do this process, we actually assess what is the likelihood of harm, what is the significant um, impact of that harm, and, and how many people have been affected. So we, we take all of those components into play, and then we start to see where we need to uh, go with the, the notification. Sometimes it may also include notifying police. So if a criminal act has happened, there, there will be an aspect where there's police law enforcement, uh, you know, the federal police or local police will have to be engaged as well, because right. uh, there could be, uh, you know, criminal activity as part of the actual breach itself. Mm. Well, I suppose if they um, if they manage to hack into the system and change uh, account details for a payroll run, as an example, and then their payroll run goes, technically they've stolen money from the business. So absolutely, that would be one right there. And, and the same with uh, those uh, spear phishing type attacks, where uh, you get the business email compromise, where you have uh, an individual that that is, um, uh, you know, pretending to be the CEO of the company, asking you to to pay a invoice quickly to the, the financial controller. And if you, right. the processes and, and procedures aren't strong enough and they actually do send that money. So there's a, a both the criminal activity of requesting that to be done, of, of impersonating someone. So there's a, lot, there's a lot of fraudulent activity around that, but also what was there any, uh, you know, criminal um, negligence from the person who actually did that. So if the, you have strong policies in place and they've ignored those, the, there could be an ele element of uh, criminal negligence. Right. 
Alrighty, so what about our final step? That was the uh, was the review part, wasn't it? Yeah, so it's the review. So that's that's kind of the part where we, we can take a breath now and we we fully investigate what caused it. So then we're starting to look at their long-term um, plan. So how are we going to prevent that from happening in the future? How uh, how was our, our response plan process? How did that work in the, in the actual event? So you take a, a bit of a step back and start to look, okay, did all of our steps, did we follow the response plan the way that we thought it should happen? And did did it actually meet the requirements of the business? So it's it's about looking at all of that. It's also looking at um, the staff training. So did all of, all of the staff training, did that happen? Were people aware of what their responsibilities were? Uh, one of the things we do see with these plans is that they're not a once-off document. You can't create one of these plans and mm. put it in the drawer and wait for it to um, an issue to happen and, and pull it out. The, as you said, the staff need to understand the plan. They need yeah. to be constantly uh, reminded of it. So retrained. Uh, we recommend at least a yearly basis, if not mm -hmm. six monthly, uh, of of reminding everyone what the responsibilities are, including the people who are in the response team is what their responsibilities are. <laughs> They'll forget. They will. They <laughs> will forget. Sort of and they need uh, to it, respond. It can also be uh, quite <laughs> handy to run sort of a, a practice. So you can come up with a scenario and have the response team try and think out how they would actually respond in that that scenario. So it might be a, 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 a staff member has mistakenly sent a client list to a number of people and then, then okay how is everyone going to respond to that and what are the what are the responsibilities kind of like dry dry running us yeah that's a very good it idea. is yeah awesome okay well I, I think we have got to about time and there was a, a lot of information in there so i hope uh, everyone got something from that so thanks for your time martin you welcome now uh, i'll remind everybody uh for our next one uh coming up um, so that will be in a week's time and we will be finishing up with the uh, recover uh, section. So uh, make sure you sign up for that one. Uh, I will do a bit of a, a review uh, again of all the sections that we have covered just because it's the final one. Um, but then we'll also dig into uh, this uh, recover section as well. So um, lastly, if anyone does need any more information or they want to chat to us about um, you know whether it's the response plan or anything else that we've covered uh, there's my email you can get hold of me directly so that's cybersecurity at uh, mercuryit.com.au uh, otherwise i uh, hope to see you guys next week cheers <laughs>